It's great to see everyone here this morning. If you did not pick up a copy of the publication called Reflections, there's a few that are left back on the bookshelf. I received this in the mail. It seems to be from Oklahoma, from what I can tell in the back. It's got some good articles in it concerning morality and things of that nature. Also, I have placed an article in there that Richard Stevens wrote from Han Freeway Church of Christ, Should Christians Help the Salvation Army? It's a very interesting article concerning uh, whether it is right for us to support that religious organization or not. So if you have not picked that uh, information up, there's some good reading for you to reflect upon, as it is called, Reflections, as it takes uh, scriptures uh, from the Bible and talks about them. And the issue this month or for this time period is morality and uh, the importance of morality in our day and age. Today we're going to talk a lot about sacrifice. We're going to talk about sacrifice this morning. Tonight, as we're going through every book of the Old Testament, we're going to look at sacrifice as we go into the book of Leviticus. As we see in the book of Leviticus, the sacrificial system by which a person was made right before God, and see how that foreshadows the death of Christ on the cross. But this morning we want to look at Christian sacrifices. We want to look into the New Testament and see what the Bible says about sacrifice. You know, this time of year the emphasis is placed upon the birth of Christ. The Bible places the emphasis on the death of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, we've looked at this last week, but I want to look at it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Lord's church at Corinth. He's talking about disfellowshipping the immoral man who is living in sin. And he says in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ is. Our Passover was sacrificed for us. You may remember last week we talked about the Passover as we saw Christ in the book of Exodus. How that he is our Passover sacrifice. Uh, Paul says in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now I want you to notice something. Tonight we're going to focus on the sacrifice of Christ. This morning I just want to touch on it a little bit. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He died on the cross for us. And verse 8, Paul is saying to them, this should have an impact on your life. This should have the impact on the life of the church and on the life of the individual Christian in the church. Therefore, verse 8, since Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, he was the sacrifice for sin so we could receive salvation. Therefore, as a result of that, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, leaven representing sin here, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. A change must take place. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. A change in a person who believes in that sacrifice, who has accepted it and submitted himself to Christ as Lord, therefore there must be a change. And as a result of the sacrifice of Christ, there are sacrifices, plural, that God demands of us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We're going to see this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Because Christ is that ultimate sacrifice for sin, we don't have to go through the ceremonies and the process of animal sacrifices That they did in the Old Testament. Christ is our sacrifice for sin. But there are sacrifices demanded of us. 
if we wish to be pleasing in God's sight. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. If you read Romans chapters 1 through 11, you find this great scheme whereby God makes people right with Himself. They are justified by obedient faith through the death of Jesus Christ. Starting in chapter 12, Paul says, here is how you are to respond to that great sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may discern what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As a result of knowing what God has done to provide salvation for us through His Son, through the blood of Christ, that sacrifice that was made on the cross, therefore, the response to that is we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Not a dead animal sacrifice, but our entire existence is to be dedicated and committed to God. I think sometimes this type of uh, lesson is being neglected when we talk to people about conversion. It's not simply people getting religious. It's not simply converting people to baptism and then they go their merry way. We need to let people know that if you're going to be obedient to the will of God, if you're going to obey the gospel, you from this point on, you're going to present yourself as a living sacrifice to God dedicated, consecrated to His will. And if you're not willing to do that, then you can't be a disciple of Christ. Jesus made that very clear. Clear Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, and talking about dedication and commitment, how that He must be number one. All of us have a priority list in our hearts. Something is number one on that list. According to the Bible, God, Christ, the kingdom, those are supposed to be number one on that list. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Verse 39, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you love and you put anyone before Christ, he is saying, you are not worthy of me. And if you're not willing to give yourself as a living sacrifice before God, as Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, Christ is saying, you're not worthy of me. And if you're not willing to lose your life for my sake, totally dedicate yourself to me, you're not worthy of me. If you try to find your life, you're going to lose. That is, if you want to try to do your own thing in this life, live how you want to live, like Frank Sinatra said, do it my way, you'll lose. You'll be lost. But he says, if you lose yourself for my sake, then you will truly find life. Dedication, commitment, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, Paul understood this. Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The reason for his existence was Christ. And to die is gain. It's an advantage. Because if you're living for Christ, you'll die in Christ and if you die in Christ, you're going to a better, better place. The commitment, that dedication that is uh, there, that living sacrifice. And I want you to think about this on a practical level. Next week is the 25th. There's going to be a lot of Christians who are going to stay home from worship service to be with their family. They're going to forsake the assembly. Can we really say that Christ is number one on our priority list if we're willing to stay home and forsake the assembly to be with our family? 
Is Christ going to be number one only when it's convenient for us? Or when family, family comes into town, we're going to forsake an opportunity to worship and praise Him, which we'll look at a little later on, to be with family. Jesus said, if you love anyone more than me, mother, father, sister, brother, uh, daughter, or son, you're not worthy of me. It's priority. This is an opportunity, if they're not Christians, to expose them to New Testament Christianity. This is an opportunity to probably reclaim a wayward Christian. Don't stay home and forsake the assembly just because it's Christmas Day. There's nothing special about December 25th, according to the Bible. We'll talk more about that next week. But according to the Scripture, every first day of the week is special and sacred, and we are to set it aside and not put anything before it. Commitment, dedication unto God. We are presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, having God, Christ, and His kingdom Matthew 6 and verse 33, first on that priority list. Sometimes when you talk to people like or to, about this situation, they get very, very upset. But it's a matter of priorities. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. The apostle Peter talks about how that there is a new priesthood under the new covenant. A new priesthood. First, first uh, Peter chapter two verses four through five. Peter says, "Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious." Talking about Christ. Verse five: You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's using the imagery here of a temple and of a priesthood. And he says Christ is that living stone that was rejected by men, but is the most important, important stone in the building. He says you as Christians, you're living stones, and you're being built up as a spiritual house. He's talking about the temple. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, and Ephesians chapter 2. Two verses 19 through 22, Paul says the church is the temple. And each individual Christian in the church is a temple. But collectively, as the church, we are living stones in this temple. We have only one high priest, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the one and only mediator, the go-between. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, and Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He is the only one that we go through to go to the Father. He says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As Christians, we are not only living stones in this spiritual house, the church, but we are a holy priesthood. Every Christian is a priest. There's not a set-aside group of people within the church that have designated special clothing, and they are priests that you go confess your sins to. Every Christian is a priest according to the New Testament. And as priest, verse 5 of 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us that we offer up spiritual sacrifices, plural, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind, Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice for sin. His sacrifice, once for all, was sufficient to bring about salvation. But we have an obligation as Christians, as being stones in this spiritual house, as being priests, part of a royal holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God through Jesus Christ. Let's look at some of those spiritual sacrifices that we render as Christians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Our labor in Christ is one of those sacrifices. Our labor, our work in Christ is one of those spiritual sacrifices that we render. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. He said in verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing, 
that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Notice verse 17. Yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Verse 18, for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. He's telling them that you are to do all things. You don't grumble. You don't complain. You don't dispute. You be blameless and harmless. You're the children of God. You're the lights in this world. You hold fast to the word of life and rejoice in labor. And he says in verse 17, he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering in his service concerning their faith, verse 17. That imagery is very interesting. It's taken from Exodus chapter 29, verses 38 through 41, where wine was poured upon the burnt offering that was offered. And he was saying to the Philippian brethren, you are making these spiritual sacrifices, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on your service of faith. In other words, they're working together to serve the Lord. Their labor in the Lord is something that they are sacrificing to God. They're workers. And he's saying, I am participating in your labor, the work of spreading the gospel, the work of God's kingdom. He says, I am participating in that, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on your sacrifice. Now, some believe that this is referring to his death. But in the original language, verse 17 is in the present tense. In other words, he is being, not will be, he is being poured out as a drink offering. He is spending himself in the work of Christ, wearing himself out in the labor for the Lord. He says we are to be glad and rejoice in this fact. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, as he talks to brethren at Corinth, he says, in light of the resurrection, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Notice this. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's an encouraging verse to me. That's an encouraging verse to me. Because sometimes you spend a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of work in trying to spread the gospel, and you just don't see the results that you wish to see. Yet I know our labor is not in vain. That word vain means useless. You spread the gospel throughout the community, throughout neighboring communities, and you just don't see anybody that's really interested that won't com people won't commit to a Bible study. And some might say, well, then your efforts failed. Not really. If we're doing the Lord's will, we're successful. It's not in vain. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, who preached for over a hundred years, only had seven converts, his own family. Yet he is held up as a great man of faith in the book of Hebrews. It's not numbers or responses. It's doing God's will that matters. And it's the sacrifice that we make in working together. And Paul likens it to a drink offering on the sacrifice of service of your faith, as he writes to the Philippian brethren. As we work and we labor in the Lord, we know that it's not in vain. He will bless our efforts, and we're doing his will. And this is one of the spiritual sacrifices that we render as Christians. Same book, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 through 20. Our financial contribution to the Lord's work is likened to a sacrifice. Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 through 20. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, that no church sh shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only, talking about his financial work 
uh, or the financial contribution to his work as he was going out, going out preaching the gospel. They were financially contributing to his work. Verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Verse 18, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, uh, from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Notice that. That contribution, the financial help, the financial aid that was given to Paul and doing the Lord's work, he says, that is a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. And it pleases God. Verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to God, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He's saying what you contributed to the work of the Lord is a sweet-smelling aroma. It's an, 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 an acceptable sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. That harkens back to the book of Leviticus, which we'll talk about tonight, in which the burnt offering is described as a sweet-smelling aroma unto God as it is burnt before the Lord. You know, we are commanded in the Word of God to contribute financially to the work of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, upon the first day of the week, on the first day of every week, the Greek actually says, we are to give. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14, and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 talk about our attitude in our giving. That we are to give cheerfully, joyfully. That we are to be willing to give to the work of the church, not grudgingly or out of necessity. In other words, not because we have to, but because we want to. And he describes our giving as a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. Here lately, brethren, we have been kind of falling behind in our contribution. Sometimes we're $100, $200, even $300 below budget. And we need to give sacrificially. This time of the year, we're willing to give to one another as we buy presents for one another. But let's not neglect the work of the church because it is an, a, a sweet-smelling aroma. It's an acceptable sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. Let's give sacrificially. That means we don't give what we have left over after we've spent the money on what we want to spend it on and after we have paid all the bills, then whatever we might have left over, then we'll give. That's not sacrificial giving. We give and put God first in our giving, and as we do that, we will be giving as would please God. Hebrews chapter 13, our scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 16 as the Hebrew writer is ending the book of Hebrews, as he talked about how Christ is that superior high priest, as Christ is the superior sacrifice, and New Testament Christianity is the superior covenant. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 16, the Hebrew writer by inspiration says this, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat talking about those who are still uh, following animal sacrifices there in Jerusalem, they are not a part of New Testament Christianity, and they don't have a right to eat with us. Verse 11, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Talking about, again, uh, those animal sacrifices that were burned outside the camp. Verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Jesus suffered on the cross outside the city of Jerusalem. Not inside the gate, not inside the walls, but outside. Verse 13, Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Christ died shamefully 
Let's bear his reproach as we follow him. We will receive persecution. Let us bear that reproach. He was willing to suffer for us. Verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We're looking for heaven. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. And through the death of Christ, we have access to that city that is to come. Verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Verse 16, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now let's start with verse 16. He says, Don't forget to do good and to share. These are sacrifices. We're offering up these spiritual sacrifices to God. And the Hebrew writer says, It's doing good and sharing. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, the, uh, the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy to write to those who are rich and tells them, don't trust in your riches. Don't be arrogant just because you got a lot of money. But you do good. You share. You help those who are in need. And you store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Let that be your focus. And so as you do good and you share, the Hebrew writer says those are sacrifices that God is well pleased with. Also in verse 15, Hebrews 13 and verse 15, he talks about the sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips. That involves singing and praying. As we gather here, as we have this morning, we're offering up sacrifice to God. We're praising Him. We are thanking Him in our prayers. We're praising His name in our songs. And that's something that's pleasing to God. It is called a sacrifice. The fruit of our lips. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19. Colossians 3 and verse 16. And James 5 and verse 13 speak of us singing. We offer the fruit of our lips. Not the fruit of an instrument. But the fruit of our lips. As we sing praises to God. God desires us to worship Him. John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24. Jesus says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Notice, He's seeking that type of worship. Those sacrifice of praise unto Him. He wants that. He desires that. For God is spirit, verse 24. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is, sincere, sincerely from our heart, from our innermost spirit, and according to His Word, we worship Him. You find this all throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 47 and verse 6, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Psalm 147 and verse 1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. He wishes us to worship Him. He deserves our worship and our praise. And therefore, we make that sacrifice of praise unto Him. We're offering up spiritual sacrifices unto God. The sacrifice for sin was made on the cross. That's the only way of salvation. But there are spiritual sacrifices. We as a kingdom of priests, as a royal priesthood, as spiritual stones in a spiritual temple... These are sacrifices that we make unto God. Our labor, our work, our financial contribution, our worship and our praise to God, our doing that which is good and sharing and helping those who are in need, and our life. And if we have given our life as a living sacrifice, all of these other things will come naturally. Everything else will fall into place. If we have that priority right, if we've given ourselves as a living sacrifice, then we'll have no problem laboring for Him, contributing to the cause as we should, worshiping and praising Him, doing good and sharing. That will all naturally flow from a life that is a living sacrifice unto God. 
As I said before, the sacrifice for sin has been made. If you have not taken advantage of that sacrifice, you can begin this morning as a Christian. If you have faith in Christ, you're willing to confess that faith that He is the Son of God. If you're willing to repent of your sins, we have water available. We can baptize you into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then at that point, you're offering yourself as a living sacrifice. And you're saying, from this point on, I belong to Christ and I'm going to do His will. If you've done that and you've gone astray, you're no longer offering the sacrifices that God wants, that He desires. Repent. Come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.